Thank you, Dr. Alice Lee. That's a very nice introduction. Uh, I see some familiar faces, old friends. And um, um, today is uh, the first of uh, seven uh, workshops or sharing sessions. And this one, uh, I don't know why they started with treating <laughs> at the lessons. But there is another seminar on behavior addiction uh, next Friday, which is more on the theories, models, and recent uh, factors, recent protective factors, and preference rates. So uh, this session will probably focus on uh, the treatment and some of the ideas behind the treatment and some of the examples that have been, you know, uh, evidence-based programs that's been carried out in other parts of the world that has been shown successful in terms of reducing the adolescent and young people's addictive behavior in uh, internet use. So today, uh, since it's a two-hour sharing session, by no way that we will be covering everything. So the purpose is to refresh our memory, to uh, kick off an interest and to you know, cultivate interest in the areas. And because I know that various people in various disciplines that are interested in this topic. And hopefully, uh, this sharing session was just the beginning of an interest. And if we have mutual interest, and it's time to come together, and then to bring uh, uh, whatever experience and you know, evidence you know, there's overseas to see if it's, you know, that's the case in Hong Kong. So let's start with the, um, uh, the question that we must ask. Uh, where is the old control that I've been playing around <laughs> all evening? <laughs> and now it disappeared. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let's start with very quickly some of the uh, some of the background, I'll go through very quickly because it's just a two hour talk. What is internet addiction? Uh, basically refer to excessive and pathological in, in, uh, engagement in computer use in a general sense uh, in internet use. And you know internet uh, can be accessed in different formats, either through a tablet, a computer, a console or a, a smartphone nowadays. So by no means we, we talk about, when we talk about internet, then we're restricted to computer connected internet. And it has, internet addiction itself has not been formally recognized by most major diagnostic criteria, with the exception of online gaming disorder that was recognized at the beginning of this year by WHO, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So the, out of all the activities you, you, you can, you know, uh, related to the internet, um, the World Health Organization only recognized online gaming disorder. And numerous and number of research has found out that adolescents and young adults, meaning primary school, secondary school, and college students are the most likely to engage in internet-related addiction. Uh, we can all understand why, because they are encouraged to use the internet for educational purposes. And from that, you know, they found out there are more interesting things to do rather than using the internet for the term papers. So these are the groups of people that are most vulnerable. And we also recognize that you always, the excessive engagement in internet activities does not equal to addiction. In order to classify as addiction, internet addiction, I always press the wrong button. Okay, this one. Okay, you have to fulfill. Griffins is a word that all of us in this field will recognize. Okay, he lists six core components of behavior addiction. So if you use the internet and you have you show some of this uh, uh, behave these characteristics, then you can call you addicted or so that that person been addicted to internet use. Uh, the first component, I think most, some of you will be very familiar with this components or this major characteristic is a salience. The internet use become the most important part in your life, okay? And then using internet can either be very arousing, exciting, 
or it has a soothing effect, makes you feel happier. And when you feel sad, you feel you know, calmer, okay? So it's a mood modification or alteration activities. And the tolerance, okay, most of these components you may recognize very similar to substance use. Tolerance is you have to increase the amount of time and activity on the internet in order for you to feel the usual satisfaction. Okay. And withdrawal symptoms. If you are out of the internet, okay, that's how nowadays the very first thing we walk in a restaurant or in a hotel or any open place or closed place is that there any Wi Fi. Okay, so so it's withdraw what when you are not with the internet activity, you exhibit all the some of them are physiological and some of them are psychological withdrawal symptoms. And to the extent in conflict with your daily life, your interpersonal activities and your intrapersonal activities and relationship. And people try to stop but it keeps on coming back and so the relapse. And out of all the internet, you know, internet is so so involved in our daily life, and there's so many activities you can you, you, you can do with the internet. So today we talk about three major you know internet activities. We focus on internet addiction. That means you just go on the internet and searching and searching, and then the the other activities we're focusing on today is social networking addiction. Okay, the Facebook, you know, the WhatsApp, and then the online gaming. Okay, other activities, not that it's not important, like uh, gambling and shopping and other things. Uh, not that it's not important, but it is not the focus of this uh, particular uh, sharing session today. So let's focus on these three activities. Uh, particularly because gaming disorder is recognized by the WHO as a, a, part, a, a subset of uh, mental health disorder, then we, we, we have to look at the latest development. Uh, I think in April, around April, the WHO said that they are willing to include the, digi the, on, the gaming disorder into the 11th revision of the ICD. And this gaming is included in the digital, that means using computer, internet, or the video, okay? So their definition of gaming disorder include a period, that pattern of behavior has to be at least 12 months in which gaming is out of control, and the pattern of behavior must show an increased priority given to gaming, the point that gaming takes preference precedence over other interests and daily activities, and a continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative con consequences. So the very brief three criteria cover the, almost all of the six core components. And this is uh, the latest development, and there are different conceptualization of behavioral addiction, including internet addiction. You can, if you talk to a medical doctor, they will conceptualize as a disease, okay? Just like substance use. And some also consider it's a moral issue, okay? Your value is put on something more important than other things. But as psychologists, counselors, and social science, we tend to conceptualize internet-related addiction or behavior addiction as a form of maladaptive behavior. So I don't, I won't go through line by line, but the basic, you know, um, premises of this conceptualization of internet-related addiction as maladaptive behavior is this type of behavior is learned, and once it's learned, we can unlearn it, and um, it's a form of coping of difficult environment. Okay, so that means that something, somehow, the environment is not particularly, you know, conducive to the person in terms of development, in terms of, you know, um, other things. So it's a, a form of coping, it's a form of learning behavior. So in that sense, it gives us an optimistic view that if it's learned, it can be unlearned through our psychological principles and learning theories. If it's a form of coping, then we can teach the individual, instead of using this form of behavior addiction to cope with the environment, that we can you know, kind of sharing with them other forms of coping. 
that give them an alternative, and would not that this alternative would not have all the conse negative consequences that is produced by the behavior addiction. So it it also gives us a sense that it, if that's the case, that prevention and treatment programs will be devised, will be designed according to all these principles of coping and learning behavior, learning theories. And so that's the, how we conceptualize behavior addiction, particularly internet-related addiction now. And so we consider it's a learned maladaptive behavior. So back to some of the general signs and negative effects, which I think most of us will have some ideas, okay? So I would not go through all of them. So basically, it could group into physical, okay, some of the very obvious physical symptoms and negative effects is these people tend to have a lot of somatic complaints because of lack of sleep, uh, poor nutrition, because they, they engage in the activities, but particularly one of the hallmark of online gaming disorder is that they totally forget about eating. Okay, so social media, you know, they still can remember eating. But online gaming, one of the very distinct features is it, it, that I think in YouTube you saw all these, you know, case studies that these young kids, you know, go on gaming for days and days without sleep and without eating. And they skip schools, skip work if there's adult, and they are socially withdrawn, okay? And then they, Everything else is reduced to sleep, not important, okay? And the other hallmark of th symptoms and negative effects, they tend to hide their behavior from others, and then they, they feel guilty about it. So psychologically, they are not very, feel, don't feel very good about it, and they don't want to tell people about it, okay? So these are some of the general symptoms and negative effects. And particularly online <coughs> gaming, okay? It's getting more and more attention on this particular disorder because it's recognized by WHO. And typically these kids, particularly young adults and school kids, they are very asocial, just like alcoholics. They drink in private, okay? They, 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 okay, of course you would, you would see some of them go to video arcade, okay? Uh, for the video gaming, but they will hide inside the video arcade. They don't want to interact with other people. If it's at home, they hide inside their room, paying very little attention to hygiene and nutrition, sleep, forget about it, eating, forget about it, calling a dad and mom, forget about it, going to school, forget about it. <laughs> so that's what they are, okay? So, um, so that's the features. So. We try to understand what's going on. If we're trying to do treatment and try to prevent and try to help these people to reduce their behavior, there are several, a lot of psychological models that we can borrow. Okay, this psychological model, we choose this because they help us to design our treatment program. They help us to understand, to think about individuals at what particular stages change model I think most, some of you are very familiar with. In terms of mental health conditions, this model is simple, it's easy to understand, and we, if we're doing CBT, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, we always use this model to explain to our client that this is what happens, and you, that's what's happening to you now. And that's what, have, that's what we work, we're working towards another stage with, together with in therapy. So this stage is change model. Um, it include, I won't, I'll go very quickly again because some of you are very familiar with them already. So it, the, the pre-contemplation stage, okay. Actually, nowadays we run it as a circle. There's no beginning and no end, but somehow we have to start somewhere. So let's start with pre-contemplation. So it's the awareness that something's not quite right, but I'm not sure what's wrong. And I'm not ready to do anything, but I, I sense there's something not quite right. So this is the complete contemplation. And then contemplation, when something more severe happens, 
when you when your for school children, when your grade, when the parents notice the kids, or the teachers notice the kids, the, the children's school grades beginning to drop, and they begin to neglect the hygiene, then they start to think about what's going on. Okay, and then to weigh against, do should we do something about it, or should we just leave it and wait and see? This is the stage where is the weighing stage, the consider all the pros and cons, the contemplation stage. And after weighing, we assume in psychology, we assume people or your people around you are rational people. They are capable of weighing pros and cons. Okay, so when the pros for taking action to rectify the behavior, action will be planned and taken. And then they will try to maintain the course of action, the plan to change the behavior. If it's maintained, then the stage terminates. So you, you successfully change your behavior. You successfully reduce your addiction. But you see other areas, they have arrows. So between, in all these stages, there's a chance of relapse. Go back to the previous stage. So we always use this diagram to explain to our kids, to our clients, that that's where you are now. You're weighing the pros and cons. You are now. Let's move to the action stage. Okay. So most of them could understand this. Okay. Even very primary school kids can understand this diagram. Now, since the relapse is so important. Okay. If we are in the addiction, you know, area in the addiction field. We know that it's 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 easy. It's not easy to plan a cause to, to decide to take an action to change your behavior. It's not easy to plan a cause action. It's very difficult to maintain it because a lot of times people relapse to the whole behavior. So Marlet, okay, she in in the nineties she already had the model explaining what happens why people relapse and why people relapse keep on repeating and repeating the addictive behavior and why can successfully change the behavior. So they consider some high risk situation. If the person have no, if you go to the yellow ones, okay, so if the yellow bosses, if they have no coping, no coping skills that are available, if they have a low sense of self-efficacy, and they have a very, then they probably, the chance of relapse will increase. But if they are equipped with adequate coping responses, their self-efficacy is increased, they, are, they think they can change the behavior, then the chances of relapse is kind of reduced. Okay, the, we also make use of this relapse model to plan our treatment, to avoid, it's relapse prevention is always part of our intervention pro for, program for addictive behavior. It's very important. So in planning our treatment be, uh, program, we also need to consider, because the individual, we are social animals, we are social beings. So it's, of course, we, the, be, the person showing the, exhibiting the behavior addiction, they need to change. But in the change process, the person is not alone. There are a lot of things that are involved. And this social ecological model helps us to understand on top of the children or on top of the client, in addition to the client, in addition to the child, or in addition to the individuals, there are other things that we need to consider. Okay, so the immediate is individual. The next areas that we, the microsystem, we include the family, the school, the peers, the health system available in the community, and in the church or religious group or, or, or any other group that they belong to. Then the next level is the broader, is the talking about the neighborhood, the exosystem, the metro system is the beyond your family, beyond your school, is a neighborhood. And the very outer circle is a, we're talking about cultures and ideologies. Okay, so, and I think some of us are already familiar. So to, to break it, it's very simple. We always know that developing any treatment program to any school children, 
just deliver the program to children is not enough. You need to involve the school and the parents and sometimes the siblings. And just this sometimes is also not enough. You need to include uh, some law, you know, law reinforcement agents. Or, you know, some 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 policy has to be implemented, and a support group has to be established. So, so basically, as psychology and social science, we focus on the individual as well as the microsystem also. Uh, Evidence-based research already told us that in terms of primary school and secondary school treatment, any form of treatment program, not just internet-related addition, the most effective one and most cost-saving, okay, we always talk about dollar saving, is to involve the school. School-based treatment and prevention program to secondary and primary schools to have the most effective mode. It might not be the best, but it's the most effective in terms of cost, effort, you know, analysis. Okay, so with that in mind, then we will look at different treatment programs later on. But let's look at kind of approach to treatment, okay, particularly internet related addiction. And we borrow, also borrow the idea of substance addiction. In substance addiction, nowadays not so much a controversy. When I, when in the 60s and 70s, <laughs> when I was still an undergraduate student, hate to say that, <laughs> there's a big controversy about controversy about you know what approaches to take to substance abuse. And at that time, the total abstinence model is the dominant model. You have to say no, stop, no drink, no alcohol, no smoke, no drug. Okay, the abstinence model is the model at that time. But times change, and its clinical experience as well as research told us is unrealistic. For example, drug is unrealistic because some of the drugs, um, it, 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 People can take it as a, a leisure activity, and they can get it somewhere, and it, it is totally unrealistic. And drinking, okay, alcohol, is not because alcohol is for social, you know, activity, social gathering. So they move to a control model. At that time, we call it the control drinking model, control drug model. But I think in the somehow along the line, they change the name. They call harm reduction model. So we don't see the control model anymore. Okay, we call it harm reduction model. In a nutshell, that means you can still take drugs, you can still drink, you can still use the internet, you can still online gaming, but in moderation. But reducing the negative consequences to the minimum as much as you can. But you can still use it. You can still engage in that activity. So it's called the harm reduction model. And another approach is multi-model, multi-model model. That means uh, at certain time, we borrow successful cases and put them together in a multi-model, multi-model model that you, you, you go through different levels, okay? And most of the time nowadays, we will fo we, most of the program will take the multi-model approach. Okay, because it takes the experience and learning from all the other programs and put them into a program. Now the main goals, regardless of what, you know, except the total abstinence model, some of it, uh, total abstinence model has some of these goals, but mo most of the goals now is that we reduce, we try to reduce the target beha addictive behavior. Okay, if it's social media addiction, then we target it at reducing the time use, the negative consequences. And at the same time, you know, in psychology, we know that there's, if you reduce some behavior, there's a behavioral vacuum, okay? If you spend less time on the internet, what are you going to do with the rest of the three hours? So we need to increase, to think about what, the, what, what activities to put into those vacuums. So we need to increase the skills and activities to replace the vacuum that's left behind by reducing the addictive behavior. 
And then we all know from research that in internet-related addiction, similar to substance addiction, there's high comorbidity with other mental health condition. That means they always coexist. People with this form of behavior always have some coexisting uh, mental disturbances. We don't know whether which one is chicken, which one is egg. Whether they have the mental condition, mental health condition first, then they use internet to cope with that, or they develop, they have internet addiction, and then they have the mental health condition. So. All the main goals of the different approaches also need to look at the comorbidity, how to address the, 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 the accompanying mental health problems. Usually, we talk about depression and anxiety. Oh, you can't imagine the coexistence so, so high. It's a lot of times, I don't know whether it's report bias or what. In all the surveys okay, that I've conducted, that among those who are internet, they show over half of them will report they also have depressive symptoms and also anxiety symptoms and sometimes uh, OCD or substance compulsive symptoms. Okay? And for adults, they also have a high co-occurrence with other forms of substance use. Okay? So um, in that sense, we also need to address the co-occurring co mental health conditions and then we also have to include some self-control, self-management skills. So that's the treatment approaches. How much time I have? 7.35, good time. <laughs> so so <laughs> we're looking at the key components of all the treatment programs. These are the key components, no matter what program, what approach this is. Because we're talking about moderation, I'm talking about harm reduction, so it's not, it's not a total extinguish. So our goal is to limit, to reduce the time spent on the internet-related activities. Okay, that's our goal. The components, we have to have some components to help the client to reduce or to limit the time use. And the change environment and external stoppers. Okay, for psychology, we, our behavior is always related to external cues. Okay, just like if you're going to the buffet restaurant, you cannot not eat. Okay, and so so the environment control or the stimulus control is always an important component in all treatment program. So. So you can think about you know, internet-related activities. One of the things is to throw away all the internet device, all the devices that get back and connected to the internet. Or, like some countries, make internet connection as expensive as they can. Okay? So, so that's a good reason to increase you know, the internet connection costs. Okay? So the change in the environment, external stoppers, and decrease the reinforcement value. Okay, so if the the if if go doing these activities do not give you the sense of reinforcement, the, the positive consequence that you have expected, your motivation would naturally decrease. Just like the seven workshop for this series, if you come to the first one, you find me a boring speaker, you probably won't come the next time. Okay, so if you find it good, then you probably will come again. So the reinforcement value, same as for, for all this internet addiction, decrease the reinforcement value, identify, change the trigger, and social skill training to help them build auto more to in, 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 to enlarge the coping strategies, to improve the coping strategy, so that they know different ways of coping with life difficulties and you know when they feel sad when they feel anxiety they can have a whole range of coping strategies that they can choose to 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 use and support groups is also very important and involvement and supervision of family and school that's what we call the and, and include the micro micro systems that's around the individual and preparing the individual client or child or adolescence for relapse, right? So um, if you look at the website, there, because people would not come to professional help, 
when they had, even though they thought, oh, I had all the symptoms of internet-related addiction, the first thing they would not go to professional help. The first thing was search, and the parents would search for some self-help tips. So these self-help tips are available in most of the website. If you group all the website self-help tips, these are the common components. Okay, they ask people, even if you, if you find, particularly for those who are in the contemplation stage, they are not quite ready to take a real concrete action. So these are some of the small steps that they can do, okay, to see whether it will, it will improve the condition. So we always ask them to identify a pattern of use with the diary, with the logbook which is very useful, e easy nowadays. Do you know your phone? There's a secret button in the setting. If you push it, it will show you a lot of what you're using, okay? A, 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 a history log of what, you know, from 1 a.m. in the morning all the way down to whatever time. It's a call up the six hours that I have, you know, how many, how many times I, I use the internet how many times I'm online and what I'm doing, whether I'm doing gaming or whether I'm doing the web. Uh, do you know the button in your phone? Yeah, we use that for our research, it's very useful. So this is helping people identify the pattern of use. And then they will set clear and specific goals, you know, how much time you want to reduce and what, what is your uh, micro goals, and limit and shorten internet usage time, that's usually people's micro goals, and negotiate one computer internet free day per week. Now this is all the self-help tips for people. So they are trying to help themselves, and use reminder cards on negative consequences on negative or internet use, and sometimes you ask them to do some external, some, uh, some automatic lock off system with your computer or your device, things like that. And then try to develop an alternate hobbies or interests instead of going on the internet activities. Okay? So and now when people beyond the self help groups that still could not help self help uh, stage, they still cannot reduce the symptoms, and the negative consequences become more and more severe, then they may, or the parents, or the teachers, or schools may decide to take some actions. So there are some treatment programs, particularly treatment programs for online gaming is a lot, that's a lot, okay, because most people felt online gaming is very, very serious thing, rather than, so, you know, they tend to weight online gaming as more serious addiction than social networking addiction and then internet addiction. So there's as early as 2011, and there's one recent one in 2013, or maybe the even recent one, okay? There's a meta-analysis on all the treatment programs for internet-related addictions, and most of them are on online gaming, right? So they find out based on meta, we all know meta-analysis is analysis all the results of different studies, okay? It's analysis of analysis. So they find out psychological approaches and pharmacological treatment are highly effective in terms of reducing the time spent online and depression and anxiety symptoms. So psychology, psychological treatment and drug treatment are effective. Okay. So let's talk about psychological approaches. These are the approaches through the meta-analysis that's proven effective. Okay, through the individual studies, and they group individual studies together and analyze them. They found out psychoeducation program is effective. Okay, psychoeducation program, that means you tell um, what is internet, just what I'm doing in the first half, but in more detail, in the language that the client can understand. If a children, then a language the children can understand. Okay, if the parent, the parent, language the parent can understand. So some studies show just simple psychoeducation program is effective. 
and psychoeducation program can be delivered more and more as delivered online. <laughs> and the paradox is that you ask them to reduce the time spent on the internet, and then you ask them to go online to do this prevention program. Okay, so this is, but they find, but in terms of pamphlets, uh, it, they, they find that it's already very effective. And psychoeducation in a group setting is also effective. And the ones that we talk about, CPT is proven effective, and reality therapy is a form of help them to identify what is, re you know, what is the re reality, what are the positive expectancy, is it real, or you've been, you, you know, try to magnify the positive effect and minimize negative effect. And group CPT. Uh, usually, when people doing CPT with internet-related addiction, they do it in group CPT. Again, it's cost-effective. Okay, and later on, next page will tell you the diff you know how you know the the difference in terms of effectiveness where group CPT versus individual CPT. Group CPT um, for ch for for young kids is for young people is particularly effective. Okay, because peer pressure, because peer relation is a, is a very important in that stage, life stage. And then the next group, psychological approaches are also proven evidence, proven that they are effective. It's multi-model, school-based group CPT. So it's the cheapest way to develop you know, treatment program, school-based, and it's a group and de delivered after, you know, during break time like this time, or, or after recess, okay? Effective for adolescents with internet addiction disorder in improving emotional state and uh, emotional regulation ability, behavioral self-management style. So each form approaches are effective, but they target a slightly different thing. Okay, so drug treatment, okay? We don't exactly know all those um, pharmaceutical name, but just one look at it itself did not target at reducing the internet behavior. It targeted at reducing the co-occurring mental health condition. Like these are the drugs for depression, for anxiety, and for ADHD, and for OCD. These are the mental health condition that is usually accompany the internet-related addiction individual. So drug treatment is effective in terms they can help the person deal with the depression. So when depression improves hoping, it, it is similar to substance abuse or substance uh, treatment. If you treat the depression, then they don't need to use drug to self-medicate. As a coping strategy, so in terms of we always say that what's the sequence of treatment for people with alcoholism with depression? We said we always treat the depression first, for most cases, not always most cases, because if you treat the depression, then they don't need alcohol to relieve their sad mood. Okay, so similarly, drug treatment is effective because they targeted at the co-occurring mental health condition. But having said that, even though internet-related behavior has a high co-occurrence rate, has high, has 30, 50% of depression, but there's still another 50% that do not have co-occurring mental health condition. So in that sense, those who do not have co-occurring mental health condition may not be benefit from drug treatment and may not be necessary to use drug treatment. Because drug treatment always has a side effect, okay. So, and for young kids, we try to you know minimize the drug treatment as much as possible. So, unless it's necessary. So that's the situation for evidence-based treatment. Now, the newer ones, meta-analysis of treatment effectiveness for internet-related addiction in 2013. This is newer one. They are more specific in terms of letting us know the effect size. G is another denotation for new form of effect size. Okay, so for meta-analysis, the effect size if it's higher than one, that means 
is it, it, it's more than chance. It's good already. So the higher the number is better. Okay. So and for psychological, you know, if anything over one point five is considered very good effect size already. For th for all of us could know the meta analysis effect size. A lot of times, uh, the zero point six, you know, zero point five, zero point. So one point. So if you look at um. Psychological and pharmacological treatment highly effective for improving internet addiction status. That means that they are no longer fulfilling the fulfilling the internet addiction criteria. Okay, so they are not an internet addict, so to speak. So psychological and pharmacological treatment is high together is highly effective for internet addiction status. And for the time spent online, okay, it's 0.94, and depression and anxiety, okay. Actually, my research because always people always said that uh, internet related social media is, is always related to depression, but 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 my research is always that it's more related to anxiety. <laughs> Okay, whether they have anxiety, then they exceed internet related activity to cope, or because they're online, they have received, so they don't know whether they got likes or dislikes, and they don't know whether they win or lose the game, they're feeling anxious. We don't know. But that anxiety is more correlated with internet related activity or addiction than depression sometimes. Okay, so pharmacological and psychological is good more effective in terms of reducing the anxiety level. And they also go a little bit you know, in detail is that if we just use psychological treatment alone, because just now I had the argument that, well, more than half of these people that go for treatment did not have you know, co-occurring mental health condition. So there's no, no, there's no reason, not justified, to give everyone drug treatment. So what happens if we just give them psychological treatment? Effect size large and robust. That means across all treatment approaches, psychological treatment approaches, and maintain over follow-up. And if you just give drug treatment alone, effect size is also good, medium to large, but the follow-up is unclear. Okay, that's the conclusion. And then they also find out CPT outperform other psychological psychological treatment in terms of reducing time spent online and depression is understandable. Because cognitive behavioral treatment focus on stimulus control, self-control, and looking at the irrational belief and emotional control. So they ta really target on the actual behavior, your time spent. And you know, they also, if you, uh, they also, most of the CPT also had an emotional you know, management component, so they deal with the depression. But no significant difference in improving internet addiction status and anxiety. Okay, perhaps, why is the case? Perhaps, perhaps previous CPT treatment focused more on depression than addressing the issue of co-occurring anxiety. Because we always believe in the old thinking, okay, that CP, these people are with depression more than our thinking that these people have, have you know, more concern with anxiety. So perhaps the CPT treatment that they reviewed, the intervention they reviewed, focus more on anxiety, but not focus more on depression, but not anxiety. So they found out there's no significant difference between, you know. Um, Psycho, uh, CPT and other form of psychological treatment in terms of reducing anxiety and the internet addiction status. Now, having said, okay, we mentioned that group counseling or group therapy is the dominant modality, but individuals benefit more from individual counseling. Taking the cause and effective aside, the dollar aside, okay, if you have plenty of money, Individual counseling is the way to go, but this is unrealistic, okay? Because um, even major depression, we're talking about group CPT already, yeah. So, so, uh, but group CPT is still effective, but uh, 
Perhaps the way to solve this is we do some screening for some individual. We might have some sub supplementary or uh, supplementary add-on to that particular individual, individual counseling. But not everyone requires individual counseling. And they found out, at least in the North American samples, female, similar to substance abuse treatment, females respond better. <laughs> It's true, often for drug treatment, for alcohol, female respond better to treatment, okay? And older, uh, this I don't know about drugs. Uh, there's no really con, but female, older, or North American sample had larger effect size. And most effect size are high, robust, and related to study design, maintain over follow up, okay? Now, this is, we are sponsored by the center for interdisciplinary research, evidence-based practice. These are evidence-based. So this, we've, we've, they, they create the evidence for us to, to decide what's our plan for our treatment program. So other than this evidence-based, there are other forms of treatment. Not that they are not useful, not that they're fair, not that they're you know, bogus. It's just that we don't have enough uh, evidence at this point of time. Just like t 10, 20 years ago, people were very skeptical, skeptical about EMDR, rapid eye movement for desensit oh, I don't even remember the name, EMDR for treatment, psycho psychological treatment, okay? But now, because it's a new form of treatment, less evidence being conducted, less research being conducted, so there's less evidence. But 20 years now is listed under one of the very useful, very effective you know, treatment modality, the EMDR. So now this form of treatment for internet related addiction has not gathered enough evidence for us to put under the evidence-based practice. One is the electroacupuncture. Acupuncture has been used for very successful use for smoking sensation, okay? And it's been very successful and quite a number of studies proven that. But whether, and there are some, some people claim that, you know, you can do acupuncture with, you know, this kiss and then they stop playing, you know, with the internet. We have to wait for evidence, okay? Now, residential inpatient treatment centers, if is if, we are talking about drug treatment, alcohol, substance, other forms of substance use, uh, substance use treatment. It's evidence-based that residential inpatient treatment center is a very effective form. The, uh, a lot of people said during the treatment it's very effective because you, it's environmental control. You hide them in one of the isolated islands, you know, with no alcohol, no drug. During the treatment is very effective. Six months, three months is yeah, very effective. Six months later, we don't know. But it's one of, for other, subs, other forms of substance use treatment is considered one of the way to go. Is there are accumulated evidence that they are effective. Now the next one is very controversial. Intuitively, the lay people go for this one. They like this one very much. Parents, particular parents, send them to boot camp, okay, and military training. And they'll come back in uh, as a second coming of, you know, become a you know, new person. Military style boot camp is very popular in China and South Korea. And they also have studies, set isolated studies reporting, you know, um, some good results. But the studies are, are with a lot of concern about the design. But then those could participate. Most of the feedback, if you ask the parents, the child themselves, they have very high, very good feedback about this type of training. Uh, um, I think most of us are aware, uh, know about this type of training. You send them to, to a boot camp somewhere, usually far away from their home. and. Then they have very vigorous activities every day, very, very scheduled, and then absolutely no computer, no stuff, and a lot of physical vigorous and you know, very disciplinary, okay? So using high intensity physical activity in the natural surrounding to bring back to the real world, 
okay, and to isolate them from all the uh, internet connections, okay, uh, it's still not enough evidence to prove it's one of the evidence base. But parents are very, very, you know, if it's not too expensive, they go for this treatment. <laughs> we'll send them away for one week and they come back. Okay. okay. So now we kind of have the idea, the common goals, the different forms. So there are some therapeutic recommendations. Before we go into put looking at programs that are put together that found to be effective. We look at some of the micro strategies, okay? Because uh, the programs that we look at are the most of program are multimodal. They include different forms, okay? They include some psychoeducation, they include some CBT. Now, there's not many evidence that show whether you just include one component or the multimodal, include many components. Is it the more the better? Now, for some psychotherapy, for some mental condition, it's not the case, okay? If you target at the target behavior, one approach will be enough. But for internet-related treatment program, we're still going for multi-model. So we pick up what is effective for the individual, then put them together in model, and then hopefully everything will come into a circle, and then people will benefit from, you know, from the many, many approaches, okay? So these are the uh, common therapeutic approaches and strategies that we use, okay? So, and if, if you, I also talk about this one uh, as we go along, it's based on substance abuse treatment, okay? The very first one, a lot, of, you know, some of you might be familiar with this motivational interviewing. Okay, this is one of the approaches that we rec that people highly recommend. It's probably very effective in the contemplation stage. Okay, to make them ask themselves statements reflecting on themselves, what they want to do, weighing the pros and cons, and looking at their own motivation. So it's very effective, particularly at the contemplation stage. And what is motivation interview later on? We look a little bit about it. Uh, of course, it's just an overview for those who you don't, they're not familiar with. They're both, they talk about details about it. Motivational interview is very effective form of therapeutic approaches. Um, it, it, can, it, it seldom stand alone. It's usually you know, put together with other approach like CPT or family therapy and things like that. It's very effective for gambling and very effective for drug and alcohol addiction. Okay? So almost you can tell it's for addictive behavior. So motivation interview itself um, seldom stand alone. Okay? It's integrated into other approaches. Stimulus control is also integrated in other approaches, mainly CPT and learning principle. Stimulus control is to control the environment. One simple thing is throw away all the device. Okay, I watch a TV, one of the American TV on family therapy. Okay, one thing is that everyone lock, go into this, this the, the, the therapists go to their room, the first thing they sit in the living room, take out all your device. <laughs> and the, wow, the bosses and bosses of them. And they throw them and hide them away, okay, for one week. And then, then they desire activities together. So this is stimulus, form, one form of stimulus control. Learning appropriate coping responses. We have to use our different forms of approach to teach new forms of coping skills, and self-monitoring, cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring is important in terms of, because people engage in these activities, we found that they tend to maximize the positive consequences and minimize the negative consequences. So we help them to restructure, and they also in terms of their, their, their um, the expectation of what they can do, then usually when you ask them to stop or reduce, 
uh, the activities, the time spent on this, I cannot control. The very first thing they say, I cannot control. So the counterfeit restructuring is something that, yes, you can, you can control. The ways to control, step by step, okay? And problem solving related to addiction and withdrawal regulation, with this. so how do you deal with just withdrawal symptoms? Attention switching is basically, instead of focusing on your activities on the internet or other activities you can do. Parental monitoring, okay? We're talking about the microsystem, okay? And I forgot to put that, put, put down more and more um, treatment programs include this component, also the parental monitoring, parents, particularly if you're talking primary and secondary school, primary school is the more important, parental mo mo monitoring and role modeling. It's no point, you don't go to the internet all the time when they keep on using, uh, Okay, so you need to role model. The parental role modeling is also a, com it would be a common therapeutic rec recommendation because nowadays you're coming to the generation that, uh, <laughs> that the parents are also the I generation. Okay, because where my generation, my parents are not the I, they, they, they don't use the internet. But nowadays, the thing about the primary kids, the parents are also part of the I generation. Okay, so parental role modeling also uh, increasingly important and increasingly increase in treatment programs for internet related addiction for young kids. Okay, so we talk about motivational inter interviewing. Okay, and I take this page from my one time collaborator in the, t in the past. Okay, he's in polytechnic right now. I don't think he's here. If he's here, I should recognize him, although I have not seen him for many years. So in 2009, he's already looking at internet addiction. Actually, I tell a story, although it might be in the video. I was in, if you remember the introduction, I was with the clinical program in Chinese U since 1988. Updates betray me again. So around 1992, the master's student need to do a thesis. Now the start, if you remember 1992-3, is a WWW started to come out. The internet started to come out, the QQ thing. I think some of you don't know what Q. Not, those are not the QQ, ICQ thing, okay? <laughs> the ICQ thing started to come out. So this one student come up to me. I think it's one year after you, Barbara. She come to me that, I want to do internet addiction. It's 1993. I said, what? Don't do it. It's, I regret it for the rest of my life. If she do it, we'll be the first generation to do this one. At that time, this particular student was so foresighted that he said, this can become potentially addiction. But think about 1993. You know, that time, your ICQ, how many of you use ICQ? <laughs> I can tell. People are so addicted, and it's so many negative consequences. It's very similar to your WhatsApp and QQ, now, WeChat nowadays, okay? And at that time, you don't see the pictures and things like that. So um, she wanted to do internet addiction, even as early in 1993. I said, how can it be? So I, I seldom ban people's project. Okay, but I, I strongly advise you to look for some other topic that it, you have more people to, to, to work on. Okay, I said, how many will be addicted to internet? Because computer at that time, we're still using a dinosaur. The back of the computer is this big. Okay, have you seen those computers? So the it's internet is not very, very popular, They're very common, it's very expensive. It's using modem to hook up, you know, and use the telephone line and things like that. So I said, how many people will be addicted? Because it's a very expensive form of connection. At that, at that year, I went to Australia for, for, for meeting, and in a hotel, I spent 50 Australian dollars for two days of internet connection. So I said, how can people be addicted to so expensive thing? But 
I hope she forgive me for that. Okay. So nowadays, you know, people always look. So then in 2009, he put together a program and published the result, and it's effective. So he, he, rec he and his team recommend some basic counseling strategies. Um, he kind of, um, for motivation interviewing, he suggests to elicit self-motivated statements. So, so I want to change my behavior. I want to reduce my internet uh, time, and I want to do this. So you ask them to come up with some self-motivated statement, and how they handle resistance of changing internet addictive behavior through reflection. Okay, what are the things that you know? Uh, what are the barriers of changing your behavior? Oh, I will lose my friend. Uh, online gaming is um, the social aspect of it is less of social media. So when people we would ask people when we do motivation interview, people could try to change the social media addiction behavior and say, "Oh, my friends, if I don't come online, they said I would disappear. They think I'll ghost them. You know the ghost thing." If you don't reply to people for a number of days, they will complain and then blast on the blog that this person ghosts me. <laughs> you become a bad person. And many people will ghost you. Okay, G H O S T. Okay, so but for online, unless they are into the interactive, on you know, in, in there are a lot of study looking at playing online alone or with other people or with real life interactive online gaming. It's different results, okay? So if you're playing online gaming alone, uh, the barriers is less when you're playing with a group of people. Uh, at one time, you were there, doesn't matter. Because I want to know the topic, I hook up to online major game. <laughs> <laughs> and I hook up to this online, and I have friends there, okay? I always lost because I don't play that often. I just play for the sake of what is it, what is it like? Okay, so the barriers ask them to list the barriers, discussion, dis, discuss what are the good things and less good things about current online behavior, and talk about you know how your value changes, that online is more important. Uh, you know, uh, instead of you know calling people direct on the phone, you WhatsApp them more. Nobody call people, and nobody you know you know real real face to face interaction anymore. But doing the online and use the video things. So what's the value exploration and what some of the value changes? It's all right to say good things. It's, okay, sometimes the value change is very subtle, in particular for our culture. Would you say in front of people, I like you, I love you, I miss you very much, but on, online you always write this kind of thing, okay? But with real face-to-face, -face, you won't say it. So some of this, the hidden, very hidden change in your value, in your culture, in your habit, in, in all these subtle things, okay? So ask them to look at what are some of the dis identical discrepancies between values and current online behavior. Identify the stages of change. That's what I'm talking about, where they are. Now you are at this stage. Do you, you know, we're planning to go to action. And we're planning to go how we go to the maintain. So show them the diagram. And even small kids know the diagram. They know about it. Of course, they draw up like nicely with you know all the stickers and things like that. Okay. So application, so you all doing this, they you know, in motivation viewing, they are, we ask open end questions. Affirmation say, okay, it's a good idea, but perhaps there's another way to look at it. Okay, reflective listening and summarization. These are the basic techniques. So we don't ask why. Particularly uh, in, a, in all kind of situation, from a student for therapy, we don't use why. Nobody knows why. <laughs> okay, if you just uh, spend your time in asking why, then it's no wasting time. So, so open-ended use how. I think how is a very good word to use. How do, how do we go about to do it? Okay, so it's very open-ended. So these are the my approaches. And for the family, and for small children, primary school children or school age children, family involvement is very important. Okay, reframing the symptoms of internet addiction. So 
parents are, it's okay for them to use the internet, they're doing this and this, this. Ask them to look at the symptoms in a realistic way, okay? Dealing with the unbalanced family power structure, and whether there's family conflict, how do we do about, how do they resolve it? Identification and discussion, again, use the stages of change. And then, also it's important now that to feel the behavior we are If the child is reducing the time with the internet, then what are they going to do? Okay, if the family want to evolve, it's a time to talk to the family. What are some of the activities that you can go to get, they can do together? Oh, we can go to the internet, do online gaming together. So, so we have to lead them in the in the right directions. Okay. So, actually, some parents are, I say, my kids seldom talk to me. Okay. And the only way I talk to, the, I work. With, uh, he has allowed me to use the computer or to to play with them is to to play the games. Okay, so this is identification of family activities without the in, without the internet. Okay, and role modeling of parents. Okay, particularly for the I generation parents. Okay, so okay, so these are the things we talk about already. Now. This is a treatment program. Now, we, we, it, it may not be the real evidence. It's called the empirical evidence. Okay, this is the study in 2018. I choose it because it's very recent. Uh, because it's recent, it incorporates all the evidence. Okay, and it's targeted at internet gaming disorder, which most parents and the society is more concerned about. Okay, I think it's easier to differentiate to, to, to tell internet gaming disorder. Internet gaming is not good for the child. It's difficult. It's more difficult to say internet is not good for the child because the the child the the, the, the kids the young people needs the internet to do their homework, and the they need the social media social connect to, to connect to the parent to connect to the friends. They t more. People are more agreeable to viewing internet gaming as a disorder. Okay, it's not good for the child. It's not good for the young kids. It's not good for you to addict to be addictive to internet gaming. Okay, so in this program, it targeted. So I'll give you an example. The reference is listed in the last slide. And at this lecture, I'm 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 be happy to post the PowerPoint. You know, to the website. Usually, I post it afterwards. Otherwise, people won't come. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so after the um, the 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 this today, I'll give to 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 the university to post it to the. Then the reference for all the things that I cited will be on the reference list. Okay, so you can have a more detail to look at that. Uh, the, so they target the 12 to 18 years old with internet gaming addiction. Their components, okay, um, is a, is a, a, is a program that's connected in the conducted in the Western society. So they are fought to make it a very long program. So if you look at the um, the original program, it lasts about three months or something like that. And no way we can do that. It starts a 24 session or something like that. No way, okay, for I know what's doing, five sessions more than enough, okay. In Singapore, you have to get well within four sessions because the subsidy is four sessions. So, so after four sessions, you have to get well, okay. So that's how the system works. And then the parent, you know, it, we, we all, I think most of us are in the field, we know you. Anything more than six is a very, very good client already. Okay, so this, this so I, I try to modify it, suggest it to cut into eight sessions. And some of the sessions you can skip it because uh, we also know sometimes it's very difficult to involve the family. They don't, they have 10,000 reasons not to come. Okay, more reason than you ever think about. So then you can skip the session and make it six. 
Okay, so in all these components, they include all the evidence-based element into it. Okay, the psychoeducation and motivation interviewing, you remember, is evidence-based. The cognitive behavioral therapy is the main part. So, it, uh, so we, we decided, so the psychoeducation, motivation, we can do it in one session. Yeah, because we, we found out that uh, we can do the psychoeducation by distributing pamphlet for them to read, okay, or some reading material for them to read. Cognitive behavioral therapy, we need to spend more time because this is the, if you're talking about hamburger, this is the beef, okay? <laughs> if you can see the beef, okay? This is, so we, we, we spent two or three sessions to it. And we have to deal with the intrapersonal coping. Now, that's the part dealing with the depression, anxiety, emotional management, okay? Even if they don't have depression, they don't have that. It's good for them to learn. Because adolescents, young kids, you all know every adolescent stages of life, identity crisis, they have so many things to, in their lifetime. So it's, it's, it's good for them, even if they don't have depression, anxiety. So intrapersonal coping that within themselves, looking at their self-identity, their self-esteem. And then we also have a session to deal with interpersonal coping, peer relationship and things like that. You know, in this stage, peer is very important. And especially, you're talking about reducing that amount of time spent on an activity that everybody else is doing. Okay, so, so this is something that we also need to look at. Family session involve the family. Uh, sometimes if they don't come, there's nothing we can do about it, and we can skip this one. If they come, of course, we try our very best to persuade them to come. And unless it's very, particularly if internet gaming, unless they're very serious condition, they probably will not come. <laughs> so, so, so it's in real, reality, okay. Uh, development of a new lifestyle, again, is a, is a component talking about, you know, substitu substituting the behavioral vacuum, okay. If they don't do internet gaming, what do they do, okay. Relapse prevention is also very important components of any addiction program, okay? So this is our outline. So, strain your eyes a little bit. <laughs> Can you read it? No, there's no way to go detailed, the point by point, okay? So I list the paper for you to read. It's this, uh, I, I can't type it with a slide. I try to type it out, but then it will be running into 20 slides, okay? So I think of an easy way just to screenshot it. <laughs> so basically, now I suggest the psychoeducation motivation. So altogether it's an eight session, okay? It's with reasonable limit. And whether you want them to come weekly. So it's a, it's a individual base. We, we plan to be individual, but it also can be a group, okay? And the best thing is the uh, school base, if you can persuade the school to, if you're doing group school base. Um, so it's a, this planning is, is more like a group, either group or individual. If it's, more individual. If you want to do it in a group setting, you probably have to modify the program a little bit, okay? But I guess in Hong Kong, most of the time, we probably would be doing group, yeah. So, and uh, who is a target? I would say that if you're school-based, it probably, you have to come up with a very nice title, not to stigmatize those kids that participate. And who are eligible? So I would say that even if they don't fulfill the criteria for internet addiction, those who have, um, uh, could show problems in schoolwork uh, that's related to the internet behavior, or they spend a lot of time, uh, even though they don't fulfill the criteria for addiction, we also can include them in as a prevention program, as a harm reduction program. So it's not just meant for the clinical addicted person, okay? So um, the first session will be psychoeducation, motivation. Basically, we ask them to re reflect upon the right statement about their motivation, where they are in the stages of change. And then the most uh, very important thing is after 
um, we have to tell them the, the realistic aspect and what our understanding of addictive behavior. And for example, we view it as a maladaptive forms. We tell them it's a learned behavior to cope with something in your life, okay? Or to, because you find very boring, oh, loneliness, boring. It's also another mental health condition. We have to deal with this group of kids. Uh, all those, you know, behavior addiction, you know, children and adults, loneliness is another issue. Uh, it's not to the point of depression, but the sense of loneliness. So, so another way of dealing with the sense of loneliness, the self of being with other people, okay? So, um, so the psychoeducation about, you know, what is addictive behavior, what's internet, is a more addictive form, where are you, the state, tell them, explain to them the stages of changes, probably 30, half an hour, okay? So, and then time to go setting, where do you, you know, how, how do you want to go about it? Okay, what are our goals? And in set, the goal setting is also a very important part in this first session because we don't have too many times. And the first session, we probably want to work on the goal setting to have a common understand, understanding where you are now in terms of status of change. I suggest most of our, our, our clients will probably somewhere in the contemplation phase. Okay, and this psychoeducation also make that to help them to move from pre-contemplation to contemplation. To weigh the pros and cons that it can be unlearned and there are other ways to deal with your life, to spend your time with less of the negative consequences. And then goal setting. Okay, we all know goal setting must not be too ambitious. If it's ambitious, then everybody will so 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 frustrated. So the goal setting is also very very important, so, and it has to be seen as reasonable by the client, same as seen by reasonable by the children or the young kids. Okay, so it's unrealistic to tell, to, to tell them not to be on you know internet the whole day. Okay, and you ask them what's the time? What is the reasonable time now? three weeks, two weeks later, three weeks later, because as you go back, perhaps for the first week, you reduce six hours to five hours. The next week, how about five, three hours reduce. So set these goals, micro goals, and the time frame as well. So first session, we probably have to accomplish this one. And then we go to the beef. Okay, the cognitive behavior therapy, we probably need to spend two to four sessions because there's a lot of things we need to do to identify what's the stimulus, okay? And I, in terms of internet related, uh, 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 in terms of internet gaming, okay, we need to identify what, what do they use for internet gaming. Oh, they use everything, the console, the smartphone, the computer, and where are they? Okay, and how do you access to those gaming, those games? Do you buy it or you do you download it and some friends give it to you? And so we need to have a list of all this information. So you have to ask them to look at the stimulus, the time, to understand. And you know, CPT, the main thing is what ABC, the antecedent behavior consequences. These three sessions we have to identify What's the antecedent? What well, was well, before that you start playing games, okay? And the behavior, how long you play, what type of game you play. Play along with others, or real time, interactive. Do you always lose? Uh, do you need money to play or whatever? And how do you obtain the games? And, and what, 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 so the consequences, okay? So this three session is stimulus, identify the stimulus as, uh, you know, you might not finish in one session, the first session, you. Maybe the second session after the first session is just a uh, lots of information. And then and after you do all this A B C and then you have to and then you work towards the goal and then you have to also look at the coping responses. So when the antecedent comes, instead of doing the internet gaming, what do you do? Okay. Maybe that the kid said I feel very angry at my parents. They always fight with each other. So I go back to my room and do the game and, and, and lock on the you know, game and do it. Then the antecedent. 
Okay, so I will have to work on the coping. So when your parents start fighting, instead of going online with your game, what do you do? What can you do instead? So work with them. The alternative coping strategy and problem solving. Okay, so if there's problem, then how do you solve instead of going online? Okay, and also there's one thing we need to uh, do is the withdrawal and craving. Okay, this is all substance related, you know, treatment program. Okay, when you reduce the time. Then this sense of craving, I can you know, always think about it. I cannot not, not do it. So how do you deal with craving? Again, how do you deal with these withdrawal symptoms? So these are the CB, CBT things that we have to deal with. And you take out all your usual CBT micro skills. So on the last column, these are the CBT micro skills that help you to work with your client, how to deal with the craving how to deal with the withdrawal symptoms, okay? And say, uh, then how to develop you know, a problem solving. Do I have time to go individual ones? Okay, yes and no. So we go through all first, okay? So this is uh, beef, so we spend most of the time. Then comes to the, so we deal with all, that the three to four sessions CPT is targeted at the internet gaming behavior. So it's very focused, okay. Um, this type of client, luckily, hopefully, is we don't have to deal with crisis, mental health crisis, like suicidal thoughts, okay. Not that it don't have, it does not have. When it have, we have to deal with it first. Uh, if you're so unlucky during for some, some, someone, uh, maybe their internet gaming behavior is not very severe, but their other life stress is so severe that they decide they, they have this suicidal ideation, severe depressive symptoms, then we have to deal with that first. If not, then we deal with focus, the, 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 the internet uh, related addiction behavior, in this case, the gaming behave, behavior first. Okay, so the three to four session on CPT is targeted on the behavior. If they don't have any uh, mental health crisis, such as suicidal thoughts or self-harming behavior, then we move on to the dealing with the next component of the program is the intrapersonal coping. This is the time we deal with the mental health, we deal with the emotional management. Okay, so we look at that, you know, where, you know, in this type, in this age, the mental health depression symptoms, um, we probably don't know the reason why they exist, but then it's most of the time we find out that it's related to the identity, the self-esteem. So we, this is the time we're looking at, you know, explore how do they view themselves, their sense of self-esteem, where the you know, self-concept and things like that. And then this, the last column is the intervention strategy with how to improve the self-identity and to also how to use self-affirmation, self-reinforcement, to improve their self-esteem and self-confidence, and how them they can build up a more realistic identity. Okay. So, and also we deal with the emotional management. What 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 can they do when they feel depressed, and what they can what they can do to make them feel less depressed. Okay. Um, you know, then all these you know, you know CPT things about you know pleasant activity scheduling and all those things. Then we slot them in. So these two sessions mainly concern about the intrapersonal issues. Okay, that some of your client might not have problems. Do remember that. So if your if, if your client if the client from your assessment we're talking about the background history and things like that when you assess them, it's not related to depression, it's not related to poor self esteem, poor yeah, vague self identity. Then these two session can be shorted. Okay, for those who and the cause of dealing with your internet addiction 
internet gaming. If you find that it's, it's a main coping strategy to deal with the depression, then these two sessions you might want to lengthen a little bit. Okay, so, so, so it's just you have to, so it's very important. Uh, one of the common evidence-based practice, although we have evidence-based practice from other people, but you still need to tailor it to your individual client. So if your client's internet gaming disorder is strongly related or his, that person shows a strong, very severe depression, okay, then this interpersonal coping session may be lengthened to further work on the depression, okay. So we said we deal with the internet behavior first and then now we deal with the depression, okay. But of course, if the person is really suicidal, actively suicidal, we have to deal with it first. So this intrapersonal coping can be lengthened. All right, same, similar to the next component, interpersonal coping, okay? If that thing, if the person that's addicted to internet gaming, you find they have a very poor social skill, very non-assertive, okay? Then this is, a, you can also lengthen this. So basically, internet personal coping, even we said argue, even with the person have no, no real problem with all these issues, social skill, assertiveness, it's good to also to have a session on this component so that you can equip them with alternate behavior repertoire. Okay, it's a form of en 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 enriching the coping responses. So these sessions talk about communication style, how to say no, assertiveness training, and how to you know, express yourself but not uh, in a way that you know, uh, uh, people can, you know, can not to be abrasive, okay? So this is a session, again, depends on the client, you can lengthen it. But we suggested for, for this entire component, there will be at least one session on this dealing with the interpersonal coping. And the next session, next session, family session. We are lucky if we got the family to come up, but they probably would just come up for one session, okay, or half a session. So you do as much as you can, but during the course of the previous session, you probably can understand your client, the family relationship. Okay, so how, how strongly you make it that they can come in for one session or maybe more than one session, depends on your assessment. That are they, is this kid in a really disturbing, you know, disruptive family? Okay, are the parents always fighting with each other? Are the parents very controlling? And are the parents have no boundary issues? Or are the parents ethics themselves? Okay, we did a study on you know parental behavior and the children's very strongly correlated. Okay, so just like smoke, smoking parents usually, you know, the chances of having the children also smoking is very high. Okay, so again, this session whether you skip it, if they don't come, if you try best, they come. But if in your assessment that fam is really a disruptive family, you might want to lengthen this if they come. Use your best strategy to engage them. I don't know what's the best get. I'm not good at engaging parents. Okay. They was ah, you're the professor. You know everything. You deal with that. I know nothing. <laughs> Okay, so if you can engage your parents, but some of my, our colleagues are very good at engaging the parents. So if you, you, if you can engage them, and if you find it's a disruptive family, you can lengthen this session. Okay, basically we have to know, in this session we work to the family communication style, the limit setting, the mutual understanding what is internet gaming disorder. Okay, so make sure so both parties know what's going on and know, make sure both have the similar goals. Okay, when, you, when, when the child said the goal is to reduce their time and the parents wishful thinking is they completely stop it. Then you have this session is a time to know the mutual you know, expectation. All right. Is it time people still leaving? 
And the last session, last but not the least important, is also important, is to develop new skills and develop new lifestyle to make up the behavior vacuum and the relapse prevention. Okay, the relapse prevention is easy when you build up the interpersonal, intrapersonal, the CPT. Okay, basically, that's why I cut into one session. It's a relapse prevention. Basically, uh, it do, it, it's not teaching new things anymore. It's to tell them when things turn bad, when you start craving for it, if you start go back to the behavior. We have talked about, we have discussed about what other behaviors you can do and what other things you can do. Call up what you do in the CPT session. Call up what you've done with them in the, and then to re remind them, okay, that when craving comes, when you feel like going bad or you have one lapse, then what you can do. And you, we have talked about it in previous sessions. Okay, basically relapse prevention, uh, it, it, it's not something new. It's th the new thing is you have to anticipate. It's all right, okay. Uh, we talk about the uh, relapse abstinence violation effect. One people, some, for substance use uh, research, the people, for example, those who have stopped drinking, sometimes one loves to go back to drinking. They feel like, I cannot, I'm such a bad person, okay? And then I cannot help myself, there's no need to, to you know, no treatment will help for me. That we call this abstinence violation uh, effect. But we told these people that it's possible that you lapse, but you know what's going on, and you know what to do, then it's time to, you know, to do the new, try the new way of you know, coping. So basically the relapse prevention is to uh, summarize what they can do when things go wrong again, okay? When life stress come up, when adversity comes up, you don't need to do, go back to internet gaming, okay? There are other things you can think about, all right? So relapse prevention, one session, and then summarize, and of course you have to give positive affirmation for them. Even though they because um, if you see them six session, if you see them um, every other week, that's the best time. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes I'm realistic to see them every week in, in, in this place, okay? In Hong Kong and same as Singapore. Uh, every other week is the, the best you can do. Then three, Two times six is 12 is three months, okay? Sometimes the effect may not be, depends on micro growth. But um, we can, you know, because these are relatively functioning still, okay? We can still say goodbye, and then we have to give some positive reinforcement for them, you're on the right track. It's, you are right in the action, and you are now in the maintenance time. So we can stop now, stop coming to me, you're in the maintenance. And then there's a possibility of relapse. So if there's a relapse, you have learned the things in, in our session, you, uh, you have do very well, and you have some changes, may not be a big change, but take it step by step. Just see how it goes. If things really does not go, or go back to really bad, then you can always come back. But in the most of the cases, they will not come back. And the thing is to, positively reinforce what they have gained, even though it's very small. So this is something for them to take note, to, to bring home that I did play internet game at least maybe 30 minutes less, it's not a big thing, but I, I did learn how to stop playing and I did learn how to control and I did play less. Okay, so tell them that they, what are they doing? Of course, some do not do very well, then we still need to stop. <laughs> yeah, and how do we stop? We will repeat, this is what we have discussed, and although you might not be, you know, having the result or the, as expected, but you can always keep on trying, keep on practicing, just like swimming. You learn it, you have to still have to practice. Okay, you learn it. Because we said that addiction, behavior addiction is a learned behavior. So you learn it, 
then although you might not be perfect now, so you might not achieve your even your micro goal, but you learn the skills, you know the strategy, you just keep on practicing, keep on using it. Okay? So it's very seldom these people will come back again. Okay, so think about this is a one shot succession that they will not come back. You want them to take a positive note. Alright? So that's the reality. Now there's also increasing programs that target the, at the parents, okay? And because there's no use to work on the children without the parents. So if you can engage the parents, the parents definitely work well, well in a group, okay? <laughs> Call all these parents. Some might have the problems, the kids might have the problems, some might not have. It's a parent, treat it as a parent support group, rather than psychoeducation group. So you might have some parents, the strategy to do is you might have some parents have kids have problems, and some parents, the kids don't have problems, they call them together. Just now they develop a term called the healthy internet use, okay? <laughs> healthy internet use. Um, support group, something like that, okay? So call them to come, parents come as a social activities, and they put it in six sessions, okay? So it just tailored to whatever groups you have, okay? Because in some, some, some schools they have parent groups, okay? So you can do this in a group called the Healthy Internet Use Group. And basically, the things you do is that it's very important that to, you know, to, to look at this type of behavior, it can become addictive. So you told all the psychoeducation thing, and then you need to role model yourself. If you are online all the time, if you are testing people on WhatsApp, social, Facebook all the time, you will expect your child to behave like that. Okay, and you can skip, for you, you may have more time, but children are at a learning stage. They have to go to school. They have homework to do. They need to develop social you know, activities for other kids. So you tell the parents the pros and cons, the dangers, and all the psychoeducations. And the most important thing is that at home, you need to set the boundaries. You need stimulus control. So all these things, and you also need to tell the parents, you need to kind of communicate to your child. So um, they develop a very elaborate guidelines for the, for the parents. One very important thing, I think it's very good, uh, because uh, all my things are in my bedroom. Okay, so they said move all these things in the common area where everybody can see. It's a simple thing to do, but it's very effective, right? So uh, maybe in Hong Kong, it's easy to do that because you don't have a big thing, okay? <laughs> you have a small flat. So, so move it to the place where people, can, everybody can, you know. And then you, you, you use the external stoppers, and, you, know, you know, things like that. So it's a very elaborate guidelines for the parents. So the parents can talk together and discuss Okay, so um, sometimes what, what we can do is go to schools. We, we do that, you know, for, for my research persons, because we do we, we have projects like that. One thing the, the, the school participate is that what do you give us back? And so we will have we will go to have a, set, a a talk like this with your parents support group. Oh, that's good. Okay, they help. You know, support group. So we can tell them and they can discuss with them. So the, some parents. Uh, particularly the tiger moms, uh, they're so interested in what the child is doing. Uh, that's another thing that we say, well, they still need to use the computer. You can't expect not to use. Uh, for them, internet gaming, if, ever, if most other kids are playing games and your child is not playing games, they have no conversation. They have no mutual conversation. So that you have to strike a balance. So these are the things that we work. We can work with the school to 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 infiltrate. We say infiltrate to the support group, the parent support group. So these are the summaries of the parental guidelines because the parents will not be reading the whole page. Just this, this you can in your seminar to the parents 
or when they come to uh, uh, your sessions, these are the things you can discuss with the parents. Is it feasible? What is a feasible thing for you to do? Okay. So now, in evidence-based research or treatment, is in addition to deliver the treatment program, we need to assess: is the treatment program serve the purpose? Okay. We need to see how effective it is. Uh, there are the most important thing, of course, is the internet addiction behavior. Okay, because our program is for internet gaming. Then there are specific skills that target at the gaming disorder. Okay, and social media addiction and internet. This is one of the example. And of course, that you have to uh, you know before the treatment program, you have to ask the time span and things, the depression, things like that. And after the treatment also. And if you, uh, so there's a whole bunch of assessment that you need to assess. Of course, some of the things that if you, if you have very good client, you can also ask them what are uh, the child, what are, what are the things you most like in the program and things. Then give you an idea what are the components that are most appealing to children and to this age group. Okay, because CPT sometimes can be very boring. Okay, and you have to make it, you know, you know, attractive to them. So um, I guess this is the last. Slide. This is a references of all the things I've cited. Some of the things I did not cite because it's is 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 embedded into those papers in the papers. And then I think um, I have about ten minutes for a discussion. <laughs>